Here we go. Live from the Hollywood foothills of North Carolina, welcome to episode 107 of the Confirmed Epic Podcast. I'm your host, The Real Brad Bell, and joining me tonight is just not just my friend, but my podcasting partner, the master of the universe itself, Jerry Reed, also known as Barbecue 17. Hey, everybody, what's going on? How's it going, Jerry Reed? It is great to have you on the podcast tonight. This was uh, something that we worked really hard to put together. Uh, we haven't done. We did. Yes, we have not done a podcast since you and I together. It's been a minute. It's been over a year. Last Jedi? No, it was actually last March. We did one on the Joker trailer, which we were ahead of the curve on that oh, one. Oh, we did. Yeah, we were. I, I think a lot of our comments were probably spot on. I don't know. Maybe. We were definitely talking a lot about a award season buzz for Joker. So, yeah. in that regard, we were ahead of our time. So, that's pretty awesome. You're welcome. Yeah. You're, you're welcome, Joaquin. <laughs> Sounds like the Guardians of the Galaxy poster there, Jerry. You're welcome. But um, tonight we have decided to come together during a global pandemic, otherwise known as COVID-19 or the coronavirus. As Jerry is kind of self-quarantining <laughs> away from your family just to be safe. Nobody's sick, right, Jerry? Nobody is sick. I'm I'm just, I, I'm essential personnel, so... Uh... I have to go to work still and uh, take care of certain functions at my job. And so uh, my wife and my daughter and my parents do not. And so they are all sheltered in place together at my parents' house. And uh, I am here with the dogs and myself and I. And now the real Brad Bell, as the Confirmed Epic podcast tries to pick up where it left off over a year ago. This is something I'm very <laughs> excited to do. And it's kind of weird because I have been kind of podcasting as a teacher. I've been doing video lessons online. So I've been using my podcasting equipment. So I already had all this stuff out. And I said, Jerry, why don't we try to do an episode of the Confirmed Epic podcast? Whether we do one next week, hey, I'm willing to try. But for here and now, it's kind of cool to come together in this moment of crisis and to get something uh, positive out of it. And I think Jerry would definitely agree with that. So, Jerry, are you ready to get on with the show, my friend? I, I am absolutely ready. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Me as well. So let's it's get a real it. pressure. Pleasure. It's a real pleasure. It's it's no pressure. A lot of pleasure, hopefully. <laughs> so let's get into what we awesome. let's get into what we've been checking out. Check checklist. Check. Double check checking of checklists. Check. Jerry Reed, what have you been checking out, my friend? Uh, what I've been checking out the last few days is Resident Evil 3 on Xbox One. And this is a remastered remake, I believe. It is, yeah, it's not even a remaster. This is a full on remake of Resident Evil 3. Um, Resident Evil has it, definitely has a history of doing these you know, doing these remakes and things. Um, the original Resident Evil that I want to say came out in 95 or 96, I think 96, uh, it was remade in 2002 on the, for the Nintendo GameCube. So they remade the original one. And after that, they actually didn't really remake any of them for a while. But last year, they released a remake of Resident Evil 2, which is a lot of people's favorite Resident Evil probably at least, you know, in my top two, um, that, you know, if you remember, have you, did you ever play any of the PlayStation Resident Evil games? The original PlayStation, I did not. The only one yeah. that I played was the PS2 with, uh, what's it, Leon and Resident Evil 4? Leon, Resident Evil 4. So yeah. the best way to put it, um, the best way to put, the, the thing that's the big deal about these remakes is the original Resident Evil games used a game a, a system of design where they had a fixed camera angle and the environments were called pre-rendered. Um the, the best way to describe it is if you think about like an old adventure game, if you ever played any old point and click adventure games, 
but the background did not move. It was kind of solid. You know, it was in place, and the character moved around the background. That was how Resident Evil was designed. So you had these very atmospheric backgrounds, but only the characters and the zombies moved. I mean, obviously, that, you know, that was an interesting way of doing it. It gave the game a lot of atmosphere, but, you know, that, that was in the 90s. So now these are full-on, you know, 3D environments. I mean, you move around, you know, multiple zombies coming at you from multiple angles. It's definitely more in the style of the games like Resident Evil 4, 5, 6 that adopted that third person over the camera view. But um, it sort of has more of the horror sensibilities, you know, kind of a Dawn of the Dead-ish, you know, lots of zombies coming at you that the original Resident Evil 2 and 3 had. So uh, Resident Evil 3 was famous for it was called the Nemesis. It was this giant creature. It did show up in the movie Resident Evil 2. Um, All those movie movies had... run together for me. Okay. This this was the one that had, um, oh my gosh, Jill Valentine in it. Who played her? Was it Al Carter? I might be confusing that. She might have played Claire. Uh, anyways, um, this giant creature that that sort of chases you throughout the game. So it's 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 very action packed. I mean it's it's horror, but it's it's zombies. It's you know giant creatures and stuff. And I, I've been enjoying it. I don't think it's as good as Resident Evil Two. Resident Evil the, the remake of Resident Evil Two was a little bit more um, a little bit more slow paced. You know a little bit more um, you know puzzle solving and things. Lots of action as well. This one is more all-out action, but that was true of the original game, too. And you're playing so. this on the Xbox One? I'm playing on the Xbox One, yeah. So, so it's on, I think it's on play- PlayStation and Xbox One. These are essentially new games. So have they remade Resident Evil 4 yet? No, they have not remade Resident Evil 4, but um, Resident Evil 4 has definitely had... Um, a number of remasters over the years where they have kind of remastered it to make it look better. Yeah, I've seen and those. I think, that's, that's why I was kind of asking. I think it's still a very playable game. Um, not that Res- the original Resident Evil 3 isn't playable for someone that's interested or for someone going back for nostalgia, but, you know, there's just kind of a... It came out during a period of time when there was a lot of transition in games. I mean, stuff was was leaping forward by the minute, but when you go back and look at it now, I think it'd be very hard to play for someone accustomed to video games today. You know, it, it's it's kind of its own thing. It's a little bit of a relic of the past. This is a nice way to take that story and, you know, that story, the themes of that game um, and kind of update it. It essentially guess, updates for... it for a new generation. People who maybe would look at the old Resident Evil games and be like, oh, that's too out of date. I, I'm not relating too much to that. And this gives them an opportunity to go back and play some of these classic games. I know I sound like a complete noob with video games, but I have not played a video game in two years, three years, Jerry. I'm out of the video game world. So... Okay. Well, when you have kids, you got to limit your geekdom a little bit. And for me, it's like comics and Star Wars stuff and and movies. And with another kid, which a lot's happened since we've uh, podcasted last time. Oh, gosh, yeah. I have another kid and another dog. Jerry has another dog. So, and I I have another dog. I think Jerry has a new job. So, and I have a dog, a black lab. Yeah, but I had that new job. I had that new job last year. We'll okay. Okay. I don't know if I've been there since it. 20. This is going to be a very uh, laid back episode of the podcast, guys. This is essentially right. two friends catching up because Jerry and I talk on the phone. At least we try to talk once a week, but there's always hey, crazy little- stuff going on in the background with kids and work and whatnot. So this is a chance to really deep dive into some geeky stuff. So, Jerry, I want to get into something I've been checking out, and I believe this is something that you're familiar with. I've been on a Joker kick. And the reason I'm on the Joker kick is I went to Comfort Food during this COVID-19 panic. And by that, I mean the Christopher Nolan Batman trilogy. So everybody take a shot now if you're playing the confirmed epic podcast drinking game, which there is no such thing. But just saying, Uh, I will reference. Bane was wearing a mask before it was required. I know. Bane was really ahead of the curve with this whole pandemic thing. I was ahead of the curve. He, uh, so... 
I went back and I watched all three of those. I, I picked up the 4K Blu-rays, and they look, you know, tremendous. But Harper, who is almost two, was kind of in the room for a lot of the Dark Knight. That may be an indictment on me as a parent. <laughs> But ever since then, Harper has been kind of obsessed with the Joker. And I showed her Joker on Batman the Animated Series, something a little bit. Maybe I should have started with 66, but I showed her like. I'm going to say, yes, yeah, Caesar Romero would be good too. So. I started with Christmas with the Joker uh, as far as uh, introduction. I thought that would be a, a, a semi kid friendly one. So I have like two Joker coffee mugs, a Joker. Uh, uh, tumbler for my coffee and I'll have those out and just never thought nothing of it but now Harper's like Joka 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 like all the time and uh, so I've been wanting to go back and read some uh, Batman uh, Joker comics and I have the Killing Joke and the Man Who Laughs and some of those those bigger ones but one that I didn't have that I read back in 2008 was Brian Azzarello and Lee Ber- uh, I think it's Bermijo uh, does the art, the Joker graphic novel, which is now considered black label, but this came out way before they had the whole black label. Jerry, you've read say, this as one. I was, yeah, I, I pulled it off my shelf when I saw you put it on there, and um, I was flipping back through it, and that was the first thing that came to my mind was, oh yeah, this this really feels like what black label is going for. You know, this was doing the black label thing before they, you know, 12 years, 11 years before they gave it that name. And it's crazy because I read this book when it came out. It came out like the October after The Dark Knight came out in July of 08. And the way it was pitched was kind of a continuation of the Heath Ledger Joker story. I don't ever think that's what it was intended to be, but it almost felt like a natural successor to it. So I was. It I was, kind of feels that way. It really kind of feels that way. Which is the, odd. The way Joker. The way Joker is drawn in this, um, there definitely are times when he has very Heath Ledger-ish facial expressions. Yeah. And the way that some of the characters are depicted reminds me of, like, if we had seen them in the Christopher Nolan trilogy, how how I think they, they could have looked. Like, like Croc. Killer Croc. Yeah looks looks very you know he's not as you know animalistic as as he is in the books like i mean he definitely seems to have some sort of a skin condition but it's definitely more low-key you know it's not as outrageous i remember i remember getting this i think i got it for christmas probably in i'm trying to think i i have you know the first first printing of the hardcover yeah you know, the trade or whatever. And but, that's um, what this was. It, that's all it was, was kind of a direct to market Oh, okay, trade. never mind. Yeah, okay, you're right. So I do have that, and um, I probably got it for Christmas 2008 then, because I remember reading it coming back from, you know, we were driving back from, probably driving back from, like, either my in-laws when they lived in Ohio, and so... uh remember this being like the first time that I read a Batman story and the voice in my head was was Heath Ledger's Joker. Because usually it's Mark Hamill. Usually it's Mark Hamill. And I remember this was the first time that that like reading this that I, I was hearing Heath Ledger's voice in my head. Yeah, and, and I go back and forth between those two. With Batman, it's always Kevin Conroy. There's just nothing that can supersede that for me, no matter, even with Keaton and Bell and Ben Affleck was a decent Batman and stuff, and I'm sure Robert Pattinson will be a good Batman whenever that movie comes out. But with, That's a whole other podcast right there. That's a whole other podcast. Um, but it is a natural successor to the, kind of that, incarnation of the joker like what would have happened if that story could have continued he was originally supposed to cameo in the dark knight rises uh you know when bane goes to blackgate and lets the prisoners out and the original yeah, that was in the in the novelization right the novelization left that in i think it was in the art book and i think you have that art book it was like the art book of the dark knight trilogy and I think you and I better. both I had that. Optimization, the movie that had that scene in it, too. There was a storyboard as well. And it was, yeah. he goes into Joker's cell and, and he thinks about letting him out. And he's like, nah, we're leaving this guy in there. 
And this comic kind of tells you why, if that's what they were going for. And it was supposed to be a mini series. I was reading kind of the ancillary stuff in the back of the book, but they decided to make it kind of a prestige graphic novel, as they used to call it. Man, this Joker yeah. is ruthless. I think he's even more ruthless than the Heath Ledger version, or it's the Heath Ledger, Ledger version turned up to 10. By the way, Heath Ledger's birthday would have been yesterday. He would have been 41 years old. I saw old. that. Yeah, so uh, that. sad, but that's hard to believe he's been dead for about 11 years now. It's really hard to believe, yeah. but I was actually, I was looking at something. This is unrelated, but it'll tie back in. Um, you remember uh, Toy Guru, Scott Knightlick, who was the brand manager for Masters Universe Classics with Mattel, but he was also the brand manager for all of the DC stuff from probably around 2007, 2008 until maybe 2016. But he was talking about that they, you know, there was a, a toy joker from like one of the preschool lines at one time. Yeah. That he was showing off on his uh, YouTube page recently. And they had plans, you know, to add the joker into this range of, you know, preschool toys. And since Heath Ledger just passed away, they actually pulled back on a lot of the joker product that was cured towards kids other than the movie stuff, because they just didn't want to look like they were exploiting you know, the Joker all of a sudden. Yeah. So. Hot Toys <laughs> didn't have that problem. They continued to exploit the Joker for multiple well, versions. I mean, <laughs> they did, too. I think they are more concerned with it being like this was a line geared towards preschool age. You yeah. know, kind of what kind of like Imagine X, but it was a different a different line back then. I was like Fisher Price Justice League or something. There's not too many but, Joker toys out there for two year olds because I looked. The Imagine X was about all I could find, and that was sold out on Amazon. Yeah. So I, Imagine I, X. I so, kind of been looking say, around. This is not going to be bedtime reading, is it? Oh my God, no! So Harper went and grabbed this yeah, off this my nightstand, and I pulled it away. This is one of the. I mean, this is up there with Killing Joke, maybe a little bit worse as far as some of the stuff. There's a scene in this, and it's kind of cool how this story is told because there's a <laughs> henchman he picks up called Donnie, who's like the audience surrogate, and he goes on the joke. Uh, goes with the Joker through all these different crimes and the Joker gives him a lot of affection, but this Joker's like popping pills. There's one scene that really stuck with me. He went into these old couple's house in the middle of the night and brutally murdered them and then was drinking and doing pills on top of their corpses, Jerry. This is some yeah. dark crap, man. This is some this really dark stuff. <laughs> when you were saying earlier, dark, you know, darker than the Heath Ledger Joker you know, again, the, the the Heath Ledger Joker was more like a, I mean, mayhem on a big scale. Yeah. But there wasn't as much of just this kind of random, you know, like sadistic activities that this Joker engages in. Oh, and that yeah. was kind of implied when he talked about killing uh, the cops with a knife so he could see their true colors. It, but it, it definitely was Im it definitely was implied. This this one was a little bit more random without a point. Yeah, you exactly. Know, which much. is kind of the chaotic nature of the clown prince of crime. That, and that's that's definitely I, I think one of the differences is Heath Ledger's Joker does seem to have more method in hit to his madness than he lets on. Yeah. Where a lot of the other jokers truly are just whatever you know, sort of this hedonistic, like whatever goes right now, you know, whatever they're, whatever they feel like at the moment. Yeah. And this I, one reminds me more of the Joker from, um, oh my gosh, uh, Scott Snyder's run of Batman. It does. And that omnibus just came out. I really want to pick that up, but I don't want to spend the 60 bucks. It's only 66 bucks. It's a great deal. I would love to pick up that. Omnibus. For how many issues? I think it's got. I think it's the first half of his run. I think it's thirty-seven okay. issues. I believe that's not bad. It's a, great, it's a great price. Yeah, it's a good price, but it's great. Check it out if you haven't, Jerry. What else have you been checking out? Well, um, I actually just got recently the second series of Masters of the WWE Universe, the action figures. These are exclusive to Walmart. Have you seen these at all, Brad? Uh, I've seen them on actionfigurebarbecue.com, I believe. Yeah. So they, they sell them at Walmart, um, which, you know, really shouldn't be out toy hunting right now. But if you're going no. for essentials, and I guess if you, <laughs> if you stop over at the aisle, no one would blame you. 
Um, the idea with these is they are WWE superstars, and they have a mixture of wrestlers from, you know, they have some like eighties, you know, eighties kind of golden age, like uh, you know, Macho Man Randy Savage and Ultimate Ooh, Warrior. Yeah. To, there's some. Uh, there's definitely like an Attitude Era looking Triple H, but then there's also you know modern superstars. There's Roman Reigns. Finn Balor, of course, John Cena's in there twice already. One of them is faker John Cena. But these are a crossover with Masters of the Universe. So these these characters are done in a five and a half inch scale. They're ultra bulky and they're made to look like Masters of the Universe figures. But the reason for this is at Comic-Con last year, Mattel did an exclusive set of He-Man and Prince Adam in a new style that they're calling Masters of the Universe Origins. So these are going to be compatible with those figures as well, and a lot of the accessories for the upcoming Masters figures are com- are are starting out in this WWE line. That's kind of odd how that worked out. The Origins is... I, 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 or, I, Origins, so the Origins exclusive came out first, but the, the main Masters figures are not supposed to come out till this fall. These What's the scale? It's not out. six inch scale, right? Five and a half inches. Okay. So they are the same size as the original Masters figures. They are more well articulated. They have, you know, they have more articulation. Um, I, I think it's a way, you know, Mattel's getting kind of a, a double use of tooling and stuff. You know, they're they're making parts and then getting used them down the line. Some of these guys actually use the parts from Masters of the Universe Classics figures, though, which those are, you know, those are more like six to seven inch figures. But uh, it works. Um, it's a really, I mean, it's a really funny, like, you know, the characters have, like, there's a Faker John Cena that, you know, Faker was the the variant of He-Man. He was an evil robot that Skeletor built who was essentially a blue He-Man action figure with a sticker of, like, mechanical, you know, a recorder on his chest. And um, he had Skeletor's armor in orange rather than He-Man's armor. Well, Faker John Cena is a translucent blue John Cena figure that has that same kind of, you know, robotic sticker on his chest. And, you know, it's, it's crazy. Like there's a whole story that, you know, the skull King triple H is, you know, trying to take over WWE Turnia <laughs> and all the other, all the other warriors are having to, you know, battle against him. So, I mean, again, it's, you Matt, know, uh, like, I like the turtles crossed over with WWE not too long ago. I mean, maybe like four or five years turtles, ago. Turtles, tur- uh, yeah, about three years ago, turtles crossed over with WWE. Uh, they did uh, turtles crossed over with Ghostbusters, and then WWE crossed over with Ghostbusters. Uh, wow. So now Mattel is crossing over uh, Masters of the Universe with WWE. So, Turtles have crossed over with Star Trek. They've crossed over with a lot of stuff. We live in the crossover times because there's the Ninja Turtles Power Rangers comics in which the Turtles have the power coins now and their own unique take on the Megazord. And some of those images coming out of that look bonkers. And I want to read that. That's pretty cool. It is pretty have cool. The, you ever read, have you read Batman Ninja Turtles? I didn't, but I saw the the movie oh. and it was great. The movie yeah. was great. Yeah, that was a that was a fantastic. I haven't seen the movie yet, but the 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 comics were fantastic. That was a really good crossover. You got to watch that movie. It's one of the better DC animated ones. So yeah, I'll have to check it out. So but, uh, these are really cool. I mean, it's it's a weird way of seeing Masters of the Universe figures back in stores, but you know the, maybe the whole thing. I mean, Mattel is aggressively trying to bring back masters of the universe there are two new cartoons coming out yeah and kevin smith's doing one of them so i'm excited to see that Kevin smith is doing the one that's geared towards adults uh and i don't think that means it's going to be adult it's just it's geared more towards the classic fans it's supposed to be a continuation of the original filmation cartoon um that has an incredible voice cast i mean uh mark hamill is you know the uh is skeletor in it so you know yeah it's pretty cool the voice cast is unreal for that show i cannot wait to see it when's that supposed to come out i'm thinking fall sometime but But all productions halted yeah everything is up in the air but netflix has a a masters universe cartoon aimed at kids 
Uh, they're getting ready to drop the fifth season, you know, the fifth season of She-Ra, which is, I think this is the final season. It was intended to be, you know, sort of a limited series. Um, so Mattel's got all kinds of master stuff. Funko's back to making pop figures again. Mondo's making masters. And this movie is just, you know, kind of always... It's never going to in- happen, Jerry, like... <laughs> so, but never but say never. I, I, you know, <laughs> Listen, listen, so, you know, Sonic just right before, I think in February or early March, uh, in March, Sonic had a promotion for She-Ra. So I actually was at Sonic and, um, you know, picking up She-Ra toys from, you know, their kids meals. Oh, so, I love Sonic. My daughter was I, we used to yeah, hit up the, we used to hit up the Sonic, aka Andrew Stokes and I back in the day, like every other day getting the slushies, man, and Shelby. Oh, so. man, yeah. I was in like middle school or I was in high school and stuff. Yeah, always at Sonic. So I haven't eaten at Sonic a long time. Every now and then my little kid wants to go there. But I totally went back and, you know, just to get the She-Ra stuff. And I mean, it was like a buck for each of the toys. So it was not expensive at all. And I'm sitting there waiting for the guy to bring them out. And there's like this little ad that plays. And it's like, you know, for the honor of Grayskull, She-Ra has come to Sonic. And I'm like, how crazy is it that we live... In, in in early March of this year, I thought the craziest thing that would happen this year was I would be sitting in a Sonic or sitting outside, standing outside of a Sonic and hear them talk about She-Ra being at Sonic. I thought that was Boy, the were you thing wrong. Was gonna, in 2020. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong. So Sonic has actually been hopping because it's the drive through, right? I mean, they have been one of well, the destinations. Yeah, exactly. So, so speaking of animation, something I checked out was Pixar's latest effort, which was Onward, which was in theaters a month ago with uh, COVID-19. They went ahead and put it on digital. Then a week later, it was on Disney+. Plus. So I waited for it to come on Disney+. Plus. I watched it with uh, Harper and Abby and, and Harrison, who's really not watching it. He's six weeks old. And, yeah. man, this is one of my top five Pixar movies. It's not going to go near like okay. the, the, you know, the tippy toppy of Pixar movies. But if you have a brother, cause it's a movie that's portrayed as a father son type movie, how a father uh, who had a relationship with one of the sons, but not the other cause the Tom Holland sons minor spoiler here. This is in the first five yeah. minutes onward. Yeah. His, his uh, mother was pregnant with him while his dad was battling cancer and unfortunately his dad passed before she could give birth to him so it takes place in a world in which it was a fantasy world but magic is kind of dwindled and tom holland's the main character and his brother played by chris pratt is this uh big board gamer big fantasy guy who plays third version of dungeons and dragons essentially you know i'm not a fantasy expert you know a whole lot more about that arena than i do and he's trying to keep his brother's spirits up and keep him positive and his dad leaves him a uh, 16th birthday gift which was a spell because he messed around and he was an accountant who messed around in wizard week uh wizard stuff wizardry if i can get that out yeah he he missed he messed around wizardry and i'm like back in the sewers here jerry this is the confirmed epic podcast so he left this spell where he could communicate with his dead dad and you think it's this movie about a son and father but it's really about two brothers And as someone who has a brother myself, it was just really touching. The fantasy stuff was, you know, it was good. If you were a big fantasy person, maybe some of it would uh, be kind of eye-rolly. But, man, the Pixar magic was there. I highly recommend it. Like, I would give it a great and a half if I was rating it on our old scale here. I really want to see it. My my daughter really wanted to see it, and I was going to take her to, we're going to go watch it, and then all this stuff happened, and... We were like, oh, it's going to come to, you know, Disney Plus. And now we're, you know, sheltered in place separately for right now. So a lot of stuff coming out is going to take her to. We, you know, me and her went and saw Sonic the Hedgehog, which was incredible. It yeah. was really good. I have that on digital. Really, I want to watch it. It's great. I enjoy, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we were looking forward to Trolls, Trolls World Tour, because that's, you know, she's six. And Trolls was the first movie I ever took her to see in theaters. So... 
Well, speaking of theaters, Jerry, and movie that has not been in theaters but just hit Blu-ray this past week, are you ready to get into our review of Rise of Skywalker? Let's do it. So let's get into our review of The Rise of Skywalker, directed by J.J. Abrams. It's an instinct. together we're not alone good people will fight if we lead them people keep telling me they know me no one does but I do I waited. And now, you're coming together. Is your undoing. What, uh, what are you doing there, 3PO? Taking one last look, sir. My friends. Confronting fear is the destiny of a Jedi. So that was from the trailer of Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker that just hit home video this past week. It hit digital pretty early. My wife was gracious enough to give me an early Father's Day gift of the complete Skywalker saga on 4K Blu-ray. So far, this is the only one I've went back and revisited, mainly because I, I definitely wanted to try to do a podcast again during this crazy time. Can we go ahead and say spoilers from the get-go here, Jerry? you haven't seen this movie by now, you just don't care. I mean, that's the only way I can put it. But just in case, Jerry, I'm going to roll the reel forward to spoilers for The Rise of Skywalker starting now. You have been warned. Okay, Jerry, let's go ahead and get into this. I've been dying to really deep dive into this movie with you. Uh, what are yeah, your? Uh, gonna th- go ahead, go ahead. I'm gonna throw out real quick. I have only seen this movie one time, and it was in theaters. So, I, I actually when I, I had to go out and do a grocery run because I'm picking up groceries for my family as well and dropping them off, and uh, Walmart was sold out or just didn't have. It. Wow. So Did they? I, I have not. I have only seen this movie one time. Uh, that was in theater. The you know the the, the premiere showing the Thursday night it came out. So uh, there are things that I'm probably going to be a little fuzzy on in terms of my memory. So uh, just bear with me here. But this is Star Wars, Jerry. You have a photographic memory almost with this stuff. So you'll probably remember it better than I did. I watched it two days ago. I read read the other script. Oh, Uh, yeah. We're not reviewing that movie, Jerry. (laughs) No, I'm just saying. So I I might confuse things. I, I do have... The novelization. That's what I was going to ask. But, on, yeah. I have it sitting there to read, but I'm in the middle of another book right now and just haven't got around to it yet. Yeah, by Ray Carson. That just came out. The art book came out, which I haven't gotten yet. Uh, it actually is a little delayed because my mother in law bought it for Christmas. It was supposed to ship back then, and she has it, but you know, we're not seeing our in laws or my parents right now, so I hadn't got my hands yeah. on that. I love the art books for all these movies. You have the visual dictionary handy. I have that. I don't have it out, but I, I went through that. We're not experts in this movie, but you know Star Wars very well, and I know it fairly decent myself. Not that we're an authority, but I feel good, you know, two friends chatting it up about this. So I'm an authority. Uh, yeah, you are. What are your, uh, if you can recall back to, you know, around Christmas time when the world was normal, what were your <laughs> initial thoughts on the rise of Skywalker? Yeah, I came out of the theater and I looked at my wife and I said, that was pretty good, right? Like, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. I, you know, I, I and, and she was like, yeah, we, we were we were pretty happy with it. So, um, I mean, initially it was definitely like a big pop. There was a lot of stuff there that got 
you know, that, 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 that got me going. There was a lot of things I, I liked in the, you know, in the, in the movie. Um, so initially I really enjoyed it. So it's not perfect. I, and it's very, I'm not even going to say it's complex. I'm going to say it's very convoluted or it's, it's, it's over full. It feels like, it feels like, like the second and third Pirates of the Caribbean sequel, you know, like where there's all this stuff going on and new people coming in and out left and right. But um, I, I did think it was very enjoyable and there were some parts I really liked in it. And the first time you see it, a lot of that kind of gets brushed under the... You notice it, especially the first 45 minutes. It's a breakneck pace. But a lot of Ooh, that... It is. Yeah, it's like J.J. tried to fit stuff he would have done in the second movie, also in the first third of this third movie. And a lot of that is swept up in the spectacle the first time that you see it. So a lot of the, the holes don't show. Plus there's a great bit of nostalgia and fan service and I'm a fan. So I'm not going to complain about fan service. I really enjoyed it coming out. Like I would have gave it a great or a great and a half. When I rewatched it the other night, I'm more of a good or a good and a half. It's not that it's a bad movie. It's not that it's a bad, it to me, it's a good star Wars movie. I don't know if it is a a good movie. Whereas The Last Jedi, I don't think that's a good Star Wars movie, but I think it's a good movie. This, if that can make any sense in this, no, uh, I, I get what I get what you're saying. The The Last Jedi, you know, again, there's 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 not it, it's not as convoluted. I mean, it, it is a very clear. It has a very clear message, but it's just not a fun movie to watch. And I just don't think it does the Star Wars saga any real favors. Like, it doesn't make the world a more fun place to, you know, to be in or want to know what happens next. This movie is kind of the opposite. It's very convoluted. You know, it it, it leaves a lot of, of work for the audience to do through ancillary materials like the novelization. Yeah. So that's why I say it's yeah. a good Star Wars movie. Sorry, Jerry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 I was going to say, I mean, it, it it definitely opens up a lot of things and and gives room to explore, but it is very convoluted. And I, you know how the, the I mean, the original trilogy sort of had that, you know, that I think it's media in res where, you know, it, it's like you're supposed to feel like you're you're jumping in, in the middle of the story, you know, like things are already happening. You're kind of just catching up. This movie, if you really jumped in just watching this without the others, I think you would have no clue what was going on. You would be it is out. You would be absolutely uh, lost if you jumped in with just this movie. The Force Awakens did a good job of throwing you in, like the original trilogy. I think this kind of does a a sloppier job, but I do think JJ had a lot of heavy lifting to do. But it's his fault he didn't take on the second. He had the opportunity to make this his whole trilogy, and he didn't want to. But I'm not blaming J.J. I love J.J. Abrams as a filmmaker for the most part. Can we talk about the the elephant in the room, to use a cliche? Uh, is it Sheev Palpatine himself? <laughs> uh, it is Sheev Palpatine himself. Yeah, Sheev Palpatine himself makes a return, and he is very integral to say the least in this movie we are he's very integral to what goes on on exegol absolutely but he's very integral to what went on in the entire trilogy here because he's been the voice in ben solo's head he was the creator of snoke when we go to exegol you see the the bats of the snoke clones clones, yeah apparently that he he had made and exegol was a cool planet and that looked gorgeous especially on the 4k blu-ray and it looked gorgeous in theaters there was as well lots of, yeah lots of cooler stuff in this movie in terms of set wise and and planets and things like that kajimi was incredible yeah kajimi was really cool i do like crate on the last jedi just the dichotomy of the red and the the white there but yeah Uh, That's a different podcast. We have two Last Jedi reviews if you want to go and check those out back in the archives. We have the confirmed crap one and they have the one that Kate and Andrew and I did. But, man, I like Emperor Palpatine. 
Ian McDermott chews the scenery in the prequels. He chews the scenery here. He's a fantastic. He's fantastic as this role. I, I would, you know, venture to say he's iconic as Emperor Palpatine. So as a Star Wars fan, when I hear the Emperor's voice at the end of that trailer, I'm excited. As we go throughout the course of this film, and this revealed that Rey is a Palpatine, as in the granddaughter of Emperor Palpatine. I'm not upset that she is somebody, because as a Star Wars fan, I kind of expected that and dare say wanted it. It just yeah, I kind of wanted her to be somebody. Yeah, it just felt everybody's. It, it felt a bit forced. No pun intended here. That like <laughs> I just don't feel like when JJ created Ray and he came up with the mystery box of who her parents are, that it was always going to be she was the Emperor's granddaughter. Do you think so, or am I, I wrong here? I I think this is absolutely something that was created after The Last Jedi. Yeah. And created after the problems that happened with Solo. Um, Which I enjoy. You enjoy. We reviewed that and the trailer for that on this podcast. Solo is one of those that is a fantastic movie. It's really fun. And no, it doesn't, um, you know, necessarily like move the story forward, but it's it's I thought it was one of the most solid things that Disney has done uh, with having Star Wars. I, I feel like if we're talking about Rise of Skywalker and again, we, we might be hammering over, you know, again, some old points that we've talked about, but you really can't talk about the Rise of Skywalker without talking about this trilogy as a whole. I mean, that makes sense when you're talking about the third movie in a trilogy. Again, everything about this movie, just I mind, I mean, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I, I thought it was fun. I think, I think they had a really good cast for these movies, but there is still an underlying problem that these movies feel like they have no real foundation. There was no grand scheme. Like when you look at the great trilogies, it feels like they know where they're going from point A to point B to point C. The Nolan Batman, the Lord of the Rings, the recent Matt Reeves, Planet of the Apes movies. I know Rupert White directed the first one. The first Star Wars trilogy. I feel like here they were kind of making it up as they go. And they had two really good filmmakers doing that in Ryan Johnson and J.J. Abrams. But it makes for an uneven tone and uneven story. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, no, I agree. But I, I think one of the other things, too, um, you and I have talked about this a lot that every movie, and I'm, you hearing me pretty clear right now? Yeah, I'm hearing you. You just had a little bit okay, of interference good. with the internet, but I, th- gotcha. I think you came back. Our there. internet has been a little. We're, we're kind of in a rural area, so it comes and goes. Um, every movie in this trilogy kind of like been the plot for this movie. <laughs> yeah, well, every yeah, every film in this trilogy is reactionary. Um, Force Awakens is reactionary to people who you know didn't used to like. I say didn't used to like the prequels because I think a lot of people come around on the prequels now. So maybe 10 years from now or 15 years from now or 20 years from now, we'll come back and talk about how great these movies are and how much we dislike the new Star Wars movies. But um, anyways, you know, The Force Awakens was really trying to get back to an original trilogy feel. And The Last Jedi is trying to kind of, you know, constantly do what you're not expecting to get, you know, to kind of react to people saying The Force Awakens was too similar. To a new and then yeah. this movie tries, to, yeah, this movie does like back again, like we're going to throw as much stuff as possible at you that is nostalgic and bring in Palpatine again and, you know, basically do anything we can to kind of do away with The Last Jedi or at least make it, you know, inconsequential to the overall plot. And I think that's a problem. Um, the second thing is, I, I mean, these movies still go to this. I, I still don't understand what, uh, you know, what the galaxy is supposed to look like in these films. I still don't understand how the First Order gets to be where they're at. Even though you read the Aftermath that, trilogy. 
I did. I, I mean, again, the, the 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 best book that even goes anywhere near trying to explain this is uh, Claudia Gray's Bloodline. But and I and I'm being a little facetious with this because I mean you can obviously read lots of ancillary material and try to put something together, but these movies just feel like they're happening without a lot of world building going on. I, it, it still feels like stuff is just happening. I mean, at the end of the movie, all of these, you know, thousands of ships come out of nowhere. And but, so where have these planets been the whole time? The First Order has been this giant menace and no one's, you know, no one's been involved. It, it's it's a very strange, I mean, again, weren't Force they Awakens. Made on, weren't they made on Corellia? Like... Didn't they overtake Corellia and force them to make the ships? That was in the Resistance Reborn book. That's the only reason. Resistance I... Reborn did describe that they were they had taken over Corellia to make more ships. That seemed to be a rather recent thing. Okay. Um, and again, I mean, the whole plot for this one was this. You know, the 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 Sith or, or Palpatine had this whole, you know, final group order. Of, <laughs> yeah, the final order that was kind of hidden away. Again, it, it kind of came out of nowhere, which was the point, but so much stuff in these movies sort of came out of nowhere. I, I felt like without a lot of, you know, solid world building going on, the stuff s- just kind of happened. And it's a roller coaster ride, and it was fun, and it, I mean, it looked great. But if you sit there and try to piece it together, it, you kind of scratch your head a little bit. I think that's how I feel about Pal with this. You don't go back and watch those movies and be like, oh, oh, I can see that. No, come on. They threw him in there because (laughs) The Last Jedi had a big backlash against it, whether it was rightfully deserved or not. And Disney was frightened about after Solo. I mean, I think they were really concerned. I mean, you're talking Rise of Skywalker did not do better. It did not do better than... Well, Last Jedi. Our Force Awakens, which it was did, the biggest opening of all time. It did better than Force Awakens. Which I don't think anybody expected it was going to do better than Force Awakens. It did not do better than Rogue One, I don't believe. I believe that's correct, that it didn't even do better than Rogue One. It only outgrows Solo, well. I believe. Yeah, Solo was the only one, and that was not... A surprise there. Definitely not a surprise. So, yeah. I, I will say... You're you know, you're spot on with how this whole trilogy is reactionary to one another and reactionary to the prequels, which didn't make for any type of organic filmmaking. I I, I wish that we could have just got a for better or for worse, the events of the Last Jedi took place. So we should have mm-hmm. moved on from point B to point C. Let Kylo Ren be the supreme leader, build up toward that final confrontation between Rey and him, like I know we saw in the Duel of the Fates script that you referenced earlier, the Colin Trevorrow version, and have that happen, because that's where the story was naturally progressing, was this showdown between Kylo and Rey. We kind of get that in the middle of this movie on the Death Star wreckage, but we I don't yeah. feel like we ever reach a crescendo between those two, like you thought we would. Well, and then again, I mean, the whole, yeah, we, we, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stammering there. It's but okay. We hadn't done this in a I, while, Jerry. I really like Ray. I think Ray was a very good character. I, yeah, Mary Sue people, whatever. Now, I thought Ray was pretty interesting. I thought she was a very much a classic hero. She kind of comes out of nowhere. You know, she has these gifts and power she doesn't understand. And, I liked Kylo Ren. I mean, you know, Adam Driver's a fantastic actor. He did a great job um, with this movie, but I I didn't feel that those... I didn't feel that our characters we were supposed to get invested in in this trilogy ever got their their fair due at the end. But at the same time... Maybe Ray kind of did. At the same time, you almost feel like the original trilogy characters didn't either, with the exception of Harrison Ford as Han Solo. I felt like, and Luke Skywalker, they both got theirs, but as far as Leia, because of things that were, you know, out of control of the filmmakers here with her untimely passing, kind of out of nowhere, Carrie Fisher, when she died, 2016 or 2015? I can't remember now. 2016. 2016. 20, uh, 20. 
Yeah, 2016. 2016. So that was, you know, there's nothing they could do about that. I felt like, Thanks. so what? here's what I mean by the original trilogy characters, Han, Luke, and Leia, not, and you've said this a bunch, not get in private conversations, not getting the story that they deserve. They got, they get it individually. Han and force awakens, Luke and last Jedi was supposed to be Leia here, but they're never together on screen for the most part. Are, are they're never together. The three of them, right over the course of this trilogy. No. So, so that goes back to my, this was never planned out. I, I, I cannot conceive. I cannot conceive of any explanation where somebody says we just bought Star Wars for however many billion dollars that Disney play, Disney pay. I think it was what, four, four, billion? four, yeah, or four billion. We just bought Star Wars. We have Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, and Mark Hamill on board, and someone says, "But we're never going to put them in a scene together." I, I cannot fathom that conversation like how was anybody ever okay with that? you know it, it's again it, it is one of those things that makes me feel like this just wasn't planned out well that things were not planned out for this trilogy another thing and now here here's here's me jumping on i talked about that movie script that that has that was out pretty widely Duel of the that seemed to be yeah, Star Wars Duel of the Fates that seem to be, from everything I've read, a pretty authentic script that was planned for when Colin Trevorrow was going to direct this movie and before Carrie Fisher passed away. And that script, it involved Luke Skywalker as a Force spirit. Um, that script involved Leia very heavily in her original role. But it absolutely focused on the younger cast and the, the new the new cast. You know, it focused on the new cast. Lando was in it too. Palpatine is not involved in that except one there is like a ghost of Palpatine or a recording of Palpatine that plays. Actually, it's from like a Sith holocron. Um it was very good. But reading that really made me think that. Everything in this movie that's done was very much reactionary after The Last Jedi to get it back and tie everything back into Palpatine and things from the original trilogy again. You know what else is crazy kind of to mirror Han, Luke, and Leia never being together? Until this film, Finn, Ray, and Poe are never together. They're together the first third or first half of this movie, which is awesome. I wish we could have seen that established earlier on in this trilogy. I think that would have made the new character. I will say for all of this trilogy's problems that the characters and the casting were really well done. And I think it's hard to dispute that. Now what was done with some of the characters that's up for debate. And I think it's just it feels like a big missed opportunity with this trilogy and this movie being kind of the... This movie is almost a microcosm of this entire trilogy as a whole. It doesn't know it what is. it wants to be. It's back and forth. It, it wants to be fan service but it... I, I don't know. Uh, the stuff but it won't go too far either. It doesn't go to like... At the end, when you hear all those Jedi voices, who didn't want to see... The four spirit Anakin show up, or some of those other Jedi show up as spirits. I wanted to see that. You had their voices. Let's go ahead and put them in the movie too. You know, at this point. Yeah, it never. Why not? It never goes. It goes like so close to pure fan service, but it never crosses that line. But you're already in that. Either go there or don't. Go there or don't. Last Jedi didn't go there. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. you know, for a lot of people didn't like that. This movie also. I wish this one would have gone there. I wish it would have gone there. Jerry, you know one of my favorite sayings on the Confirmed Epic podcast is, "I always love films that have stakes," and I yeah. never really feel like this film has stakes, even though it's supposed to be this huge monumental, you know, end of the galaxy type movie. And here's why. At two points in this movie, two beloved characters, Chewie, they fake it out that he died. They fake me out. Don't do that. Either kill him or don't. I don't want him killed. He's my second favorite character, the Darth Vader in all of Star Wars. But I'm just saying either do it or don't. 
C three PO with the I with, hear you. with the mind wipe. Do it or don't. Yeah. He gets his memory back at the end of the movie and it's like, why did we do this? Yeah. Babu Frick is awesome though. I, I just gotta point that out. I love Babu. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. People really like that little guy. I, I this movie, I will say, talking about the things that it did right, um, this movie had some really fun adventuring scenes in it. You know, when they go to the planet where they find Lando, mm-hmm. um, the I mean, festival that was, there was there. some really fun, really fun, you know, kind of space adventure fantasy scenes. I really enjoyed when they go to Kajimi again, some really fun stuff. Um, you know, some, some really fun battle scenes at the end when they're fighting against the final order. So it was definitely a very enjoyable movie to watch. Um, the last Jedi, you know, again, I, I'm not a huge fan of the movie, but when I go back, I also think it's kind of boring. You know, I think it's kind of a boring movie to watch over and over again, which I mean, even, you know, attack of the clones, attack of the clones, isn't one of the high points of star Wars, right? (laughs) No, but it has great scenes. My gosh, it's a fun movie to watch and it's a visually rich movie to watch. Like, I, I, I enjoy watching it because there's so many fun scenes. There's great action scenes. There's great characters. And it's one of those where it's like, I don't care that, you know, there's like a lot of weaknesses to it. It's still a pretty fun movie to, en- all, you know, to enjoy. All the bo- uh, the uh, Django Fett and Obi-Wan stuff on Kamino and the, the Tanway on the clone. Like, all that stuff is just so good in that movie. Uh, yeah. Anything with and anything with Count Dooku. I mean, anything with Count Dooku is is worth your time. Yeah. So I, again, and I don't want to completely crap on this movie because I I do like the movie, but I almost like the set pieces and individual moments in the movie more than I do the movie as a whole. I really like the flash the kind of force vision that ray has as being this uh almost sith queen and i really like this yeah. idea of her and kylo being something unique a dyad in the force something that's never been seen in the force that's why the emperor wants them and they can almost be this kind of force king and queen sith king and queen i love that funko pop the ray the sith ray i picked that one up and it never really explores that too much in this movie. It's alluded to, and it's just something huge to this uh, that's alluded to. I don't want them to get into a ton of exposition here, but that stuff's hit on more again, and other stuff like the visual dictionary, I feel like. Yeah. Th- this movie definitely does that. Like, it brings up some really cool stuff, and then it's like, all right, moving on to something else. You know, and you're kind of like, no, wait, 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 go back for a second. I, you know, I want to hear more about the diet. I want to see more of, you know, Kylo Ren. Like, where's he getting this holocron? Because he's supposed to be on Mustafar at the beginning of the movie. And how do we like, not see I Darth want... Vader's castle here? Come on, dude. I want a little bit more of that. And it's like, nope, we're going on to the next thing. Um, it just, it, it moves so fast. As the Joker says, you know, the movie's kind of like a dog chasing cars. You know? <laughs> Just keeps going after something completely different, and it can't really focus on, you know, can't really focus on one thing. Yeah, it does have a hard but time staying focused. One of the highlights of this movie for me, and I think this was a product, unfortunately, of Carrie Fisher's passing, was the cameo by Harrison Ford as Han Solo again. It's almost the mirror image of the conversation that he has with his father before he kills him is this conversation that Han has with him on the Death Star wreckage to push him to the light side and I think what stinks is we never get to see a ton of Kylo as far as the Ben Solo again being redeemed that they had to kill him off and I think that was a big mistake now, I get that Adam Driver would have never came back as the character, probably, because he's such an in-demand, Oscar-worthy actor, but I would have loved to have seen that explored in novels and comics and stuff, almost like a, a Revan-type redeemable character. So, But as far as the scene of him and Han together, that's just a master class in acting. That's two of the best actors in all of Star Wars really showing their chops in that scene. What do you think about that scene, Jerry? between uh, Han Solo and Kylo Ren on the Death Star wreckage. 
I mean, I think you said it. it's a good scene. It mirrors back, and you know, it, it kind of goes in. I mean, so many themes in Star Wars are sort of tied to, to parent, you know, parentage. I mean, you, know, you always have these themes there with, with you know, parents and children. I mean, here's Luke that sort of brings Vader towards redemption. You know, helps him to kind of walk that path. And then here is, you know, Han Solo sort of leading his his son there. Um, I mean, I think thematically there's there's a connection there. It's always good to see Harrison Ford. It's always good to see Harrison Ford as Han Solo. They're at the top of their game. I mean, you're, you're right. Both of those actors are incredible. Um, I really liked it. Granted, I still, I still wanted to see Kylo Ren... I still wanted to see Kylo Ren talking with Anakin. I still think that was really important. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you a lot better. You, we lost you for okay. a minute. You sound like the Sith version of C-3PO there. Yeah. I, I still think, and not just because, not this is not just fan service. I still think it was a big miss to not have Kylo Ren have a conversation with Vader, with I, Anakin. I wonder if Anakin. we would have got that in the Duel of the Fates because there's a cave scene with him fighting. Is that right? Am I remembering is, this right? Of him fighting yes, Vader? There is a scene that, that is very similar to Luke in the cave on Dagobah. So there's there's that connection there. But here's the thing. If you're... T- if you're if you're really try if they're really trying to still tie this we're really still trying to tie the sequel trilogy in with you know the original trilogy and the prequels, then having that conversation with Anakin would have gone back, I think, and helped connect these movies again back to Anakin. So you have Anakin's rise, Anakin's fall, and then Anakin's legacy. And and I think that would have been an important kind of a thematic connection. I don't know why. I think these movies are terrified of the prequels. I think they're so, you know, I think they're so afraid of, you know, doing something. I mean, they have little, you know, they have little elements of the prequels there. You'll see a battle droid in the background or, you know, Maskinata's Palace has the uh, pod racing flags and whatnot. But... I guess they're just so afraid of the prequels that they don't want to touch them. But I think a conversation with Anakin, with you know, with Ben Solo, you know, being talked to by by his father and by Anakin would have been powerful. I think that would have been powerful stuff. Would you, if I could give you a kind of a magic wand or some Sith magic like Palpatine has to just make fleets appear out of his hands, would you? sacrifice the Harrison Ford scene and put would you put uh, Hayden Christensen there instead? I think it would have made a lot of sense. I think it would have made a lot of sense. But man, as a parent, going back to the whole parenting theme of Star Wars, which is huge throughout the entire saga, it it really hit me in the feels right there. Especially I was about to have a son named Harrison, by the way, after Harrison Ford. And, and George huh. Harrison, of course, for my wife, the Beatles. But I don't know, man. It just hit me all in the field. So, I do, like, to me, that would be going full fan service, what you're saying with Hayden Christensen. But they, they just go there but never quite go there fully. So I think maybe they should have embraced it, like you said. I, again, but I, I do think, I mean, isn't the whole, I mean, was it like one of the most – striking images and striking elements of the force awakens and the whole build up to that, that burned Vader helmet. I mean, yeah. we're dealing with Vader's legacy. That is, that is the issue. That's, that's the whole pro. That's kind of one of the reasons why, as I think about it, I'm not as big of a fan of the emperor being involved. Cause I still like this idea that what is happening is is still because of those choices Vader made. Even though he was redeemed, you know, there there's still this element there that that you know these these folks afterwards have have taken up his legacy, even if that's not what he wanted 
wanted his legacy to be. I will tell you um, this. Chris Terrio, the guy who helped rewrite this script with J.J. when J.J. was brought yeah. in after Carrie passed, he was doing an interview when this movie came out. And he, he is, and it may be even on the documentary that's on the Blu-ray. I hadn't watched it yet. There's supposed to be a great documentary, like two hours on the making of this movie. He okay. says in that documentary, or at least in the interview I was reading, that this has always been a story about the Skywalkers and the Palpatines. I'm like, no, it hasn't. Like, Palpatine is important, sure. But it it's more about Anakin Skywalker and his legacy than anything else. Palpatine yeah. is a part of that legacy for the, you know, for the worst. But it's it says the Skywalker saga on the two hundred dollar box set I just got, not the Skywalker Palpatine saga. So that's gonna be the two hundred and fifty dollar box set that comes out well, next year. Well, this one was t with tax was like two sixty seven. Oh man, which so. was uh, and it didn't include Solo or Rogue One, which I already well, owned. But come on now, come on Disney. I wish it would have included the unaltered versions of the originals, too. At this point, just for getting them out there. So there know? was an April Fool's the other day that was saying oh, I, on yeah. May 4th, the originals were going to be on Disney+. Plus. And so I'd yeah. forgotten it was April Fool's Day with all the chaos in the world. And I was reading this on, like, CBR or something like that. And I'm like, crap, I just bought this, you know, 4K, the ultimate edition of it. And now they're putting out the, f I would have not bought that. But of course, that was a, a really bad April Fool's joke. I guess not bad because it worked. Did you see that? I, I did see it. I did see it. I really thought, gosh, Disney is really trying to reach out to people with this whole, you know, coronavirus thing. They're really trying to make people's day. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This has got to be a joke. So. Just a couple of things from a design perspective. I like Zori Bliss's design. I'm, I think we're going to get into her relationship, played by the great Carrie Russell. I think we're going to get into her relationship with Poe in an upcoming kind of young adult novel that's coming up that will be part of canon, of course. And and you mentioned Kajimi. I thought that was just a beautiful, beautiful planet, which ends up getting destroyed by the Final Order. John Williams knocks it out of the park again. Definitely got to mention that. When does he not? I mean, it's John freaking Williams. But that being said, I, this score is magnific magnificent, man. Jerry, uh, is there any before we get to kind of our closing thoughts on the rise of Skywalker? Is there anything you want to say, kind of in this initial review? I believe we're missing Jerry a little bit there. I'm going to get into some of these closing thoughts, and hopefully Jerry will be able to uh, hop back on. I mean, the Internet's crazy right now, especially with the COVID-19 stuff. So overall thoughts on the uh, Disney sequel trilogy. I think we kind of hit on it during this during this review. It was It was too reactionary. It was too uneven it, it didn't know whether it wanted to pass the baton forward completely or it wanted to just kind of revel in nostalgia i think that was a big problem with this trilogy a, a lot of the problems with it i believe i hear jerry jerry are you there yeah i'm back i'm back so i was kind of talking about some closing thoughts here like your overall thought on the disney sequel trilogy and i think we hit on a lot of it during this review it was reactionary. It was kind of uneven. Like, how would you sum up the uh, Disney sequel trilogy, if you could? I think I'm repeating myself, but, you know, again, I... unplanned. Um, That's a great way to put it. <laughs> you know, again, I mean, there's, 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 there's good actors in these, in these movies. I mean, there's some there's some pretty good character design. I think I think you can make an argument that there's some weak character, there's some weak costume design at times. That there's not a lot of color and stuff in the, in some the movies. But um, overall, I, I feel like it's it's very. Unplanned. I'm not saying all bad. It's not saying all good. But it definitely feels like a kind of made up as, as it goes along. Almost like if you had books, you know, a, a series of books just written by authors. You know, there's just... Like there's an anthology no, series, almost. Yeah, there's no flow to it. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I, I think it's these are really good characters, well casted. I mean, like Adam Driver, I think gives some of the best performances of, in all of Star Wars as Ben Solo slash Kylo Ren. Uh, but the movies are, are kind of just okay, where the characters, I think, are great, which stinks because you have such great characters trapped in not bad movies, right? There's there's nothing that really makes you want to get upset like Jar Jar Binks in the prequels. But there, there, there is a lot to kind of be desired from a, from a storytelling uh, perspective. So, Jerry, if you... If I have you there, if you had to rate this on the confirmed epic podcast rating scale, what would it be? So I've seen this movie twice, and I definitely will revisit it in the future. And the first time I saw Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, it was definitely a great for me. I even put in my my letterbox review that JJ made things right, kind of referencing back to uh, uh, Max von Cito, the Lord Santeca character at the beginning of The Force Awakens, talking about being reactionary. It was almost JJ trying to make things right in reaction to the prequels. I thought JJ made it right in reaction to The Last Jedi. So after seeing that and then coming home about two days later and watching The Last Jedi on Disney Plus, and realizing how maybe not great of a Star Wars film, but just how great of a film that movie is by Ryan Johnson. Uh, Coffee with Kenobi said that Ryan Johnson kind of works with a scalpel, whereas J.J. here works with a sledgehammer. And, and you definitely kind of kind of feel some of that. I just feel like up on multiple viewings, there's some good set pieces. The performances are great. The characters are still great. No characters are written like out of left field, like Ray feels like Ray and Kylo feels like Kylo. There's not some, you know, giant jarring shift in characterization of these uh, these great characters. But as a movie as a whole, as kind of a a standalone film, I believe it leaves a lot to be desired, and I. I think if I was rating it again, I would probably say a good. So up on kind of further review, first time I was great and a half, I believe. Second time, good and a half. Up on kind of diving into this, I think if I was, I need to watch it. I need to watch it again. I mean, I I'm planning to as soon as I can get a hold of a copy. I'm just glad Jerry um, Reed kind of joined us back here for a second, Jerry. So you would rate? What would you rate it? First time I probably would have given it a great. Same here. At this same point, here. No, I got to see it again. So I got I got to see it again. Um, I mean, there's some, there's some really fun stuff in there. I guess they're just, you know, I I want more, which is a good, you know, that's a good thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing that I want more, but there's also things where it's like I want more from this movie. Um, when I was when I was uh, banished to Exegol for a minute. Did you, did you talk about the Knights of Ren any? I did not talk about the Knights of Ren, who I own all of their Funko Pops, but I'd be glad yeah. to talk about the Knights of Ren, who are featured heavily in, I think, Duel of the Fates. Yeah, so here's, here's, here's like, here's like, you know, these, these characters that we see for just flashes, and we've been, like, kind of anticipating, you know, who are these guys? What are they going to be like? And, I mean, this movie does a little bit with them. You know, does a little bit with them. So, but but certainly, I don't I don't find as you know a, it's so satisfying. You know. Apparently, excuse me, that was a yawn. Apparently, though, the Knights of Ren in the uh, Charles so- Soul Kylo Ren book that's coming out in graphic novel in May. The series had just finished up before Diamond quit shipping books because of COVID nineteen. Really does a yeah. good job of kind of establishing the Knights of Ren and what they are and what they mean in relation to Kylo. Uh, it also, I think, does a good job. I have not read it, just as all hearsay, of how Snoke. It had been hinted at for a long time that Snoke could have been controlled by the Emperor. Of course, that was written with Charles Soule, knowing that the Emperor created Snoke, so he kind of had some. 
some contact with the Lucasfilm Story Group. I can't wait to read that graphic novel. I know you'll yeah, be picking I'm really, that up. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. So I'm glad I got you back from Exegol, and you don't sound like C-3PO speaking in the banished Sith dialect anymore because i really want to hear your thought being a lifelong star wars fan like myself but on rose oh no no that being said i i think rose was did kind of get the the shaft in this film but we won't we've you know we've kind of talked about rose enough on our last two reviews of the last jedi but it's just one of those things that i i think about is again you know, this movie reacts with, you know, you see Rose a little bit and that's it. They kind of cut her out, you know, for better or for worse. She was made and introduced almost in the way that Lando was in the original trilogy. She was introduced yeah. at that level in this trilogy. I'm definitely not saying that she's not Lando. I get that. She's not Billy D uh, Kelly Marie Tran, but she was introduced. Billy D, Billy D, she, Billy D. she was introduced as that level character, and then to just kind of sweep her off to the side, and then bring in the who was the other female character they brought What's in. It? Um, who was a uh, taken at, by the first order? She was uh, supposed to be kind of Finn's love interest in this one. Oh, Jana. Yeah, like. That character was unnecessary. The performance was fine. The character was cool. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, that was a sh- cool idea to have those guys. But should have been Rose and from continuing from yeah, the last Jedi. Yeah, there's a Jedi. lot of things that, that Rose should have been involved with. Um, you know, what are, what are you gonna do? So, so, so here's the uh, the big question I wanted to wrap up with as lifelong Star Wars fans. Where would you like to see Star Wars go from here? So from now until, say, 2026, by then, where would you like to see Star Wars? What type of stories, what type of things would you like to see explored? Uh, I think The Mandalorian is fantastic. It is one of the greatest Star Wars things I've ever seen. Uh, I am all about The Mandalorian, so I think they've got a really good crew right there. I feel like they're going to milk um, that to death, though. Like, we're going to get a Cara Dune spinoff. And then, but Ahsoka's coming into it. Ahsoka's, Ahsoka's coming, coming into it. In, played by Rosario Dawson. So, they're, you know, but again, it, it, it feels Star Wars, but it doesn't have to live up to anything. It can just do its own thing, you know, can kind of go off on the side. What I would really like to see. I, I really want to see some stuff fill in the the time between the original trilogy and the pre. Looks like he's going full Sith again. <laughs> Uh, we've lost jerry unfortunately the internet is really restricted here with the whole covid stuff kind of being maxed out kind of where we'd like to see star wars go from here i know my dream is a kind of old republic movie i'm hoping the high republic in some ways is sitting the stage to go backwards in a a prequel type way i'm kind of burnt out on star wars books at this point because there's just been so much of it it feels like in the past year but i am excited for the high republic and i thing that excites me about it is that's going to be explored in multiple avenues so you're going to get books you're going to get comics i think eventually you will get video games and the character designs and the characters for the High Republic, uh, they look really cool. So I'm definitely uh, looking forward to seeing where Lucasfilm and Disney uh, goes with that. As far as the films, I would love to see an uh, Old Republic type trilogy. I want to see at some point why Disney has control and they have the big, the big pocketbooks, the big purse strings. A army of Sith fighting a army of Jedi, which sadly is not something that we've uh, gotten to see here. 
So I think that's just about going to wrap it up for the 107th edition of the Confirmed Epic Podcast. You can find more episodes of this podcast at the Epic Review, thepicreview.com. You can find me on Twitter at the Real Brad Bell, the R E E L Brad Bell. On Twitter, as for Jerry, you can find him at actionfigurebarbecue.com. That's barbecue spelled out where he puts his daily toy reviews up. And make sure you check that stuff out. It was a an honor and a privilege to do this again and kind of broadcast to the masses during this uncertain time in our world and kind of to take comfort in a galaxy far, far away. That has been awesome. So if you click play on YouTube, you click play uh, on Podbean or on your Apple listening device or whatever podcast outlet you're listening through, I greatly appreciate it. There's a chance that we come back next week and do another episode of the Confirmed Epic Podcast, the 108th edition. Who knows what we talk about? Could be kind of a confirm. Could be kind of a could be kind of a confirmed crap thing, or it could potentially be some type of movie review. So, just stay tuned to see uh, if that if that ends up working itself out. Thank you for joining us, and from the Hollywood foothills of North Carolina, we are out.